We are back with another small project. We are working on the quilted journal cover. So if you are new to watching our live events, please go to the link that you see in the chat. If you haven't already downloaded the pattern, the pattern is free and it's there. So all you will have to do is put into, uh, I think, put in your email address and then you'll be able to download the pattern for this event. Um, it also has a note section at the back. So if you've already downloaded, you can grab something to write with to make some notations about um, maybe ideas of how you would like to use this or things I've said that you wanna make sure you remember. So there was, there's always that, um, that uh, notation page at the very end of our pattern. So we are going to get going. Please remember that you can easily go into the chat section, put um, your comments, let us know where you're watching from. It's the one way that we can pull our community together. It's fun to see names pop up because without a comment, I don't know for sure you're out there. So tell us where you're watching from. Good morning to um, everybody watching because I know there are people from Canada. Sometimes we have some from the UK and Australia. It's so wonderful to, be able to bring all of the uh, you as quilters together into a community and have some fun with ideas. Now, community um, ideas share maybe you have a way you want to take this pattern and run with it maybe using it in a little bit of a different way so go ahead and put in those ideas too because that's how quilting ideas expand we start with one small project and usually people see it and go oh but i could use it for this or i can make something for a gift or um i could do something for my quilt friends in a small group so if you want to come up with ideas on how this um, project can be used in other ways, please put that into the chat also. So we are, we've got people from all over this morning, somebody from California, Janice from California, good morning. Um, Lisa, I, re I recognize your name. I'm so glad you're here this morning. So we've all, oh, we've got one from Normal, Illinois, and I actually know where that's at because my sister lives in that area of Illinois also. Great to have you here, um, Joanne. So. As we get started, the quilted journal cover um, is an idea that's been around for a while, and I have made various uh, versions of a journal cover. Uh, as I hold this one up, it didn't get photographed for the pattern, but you'll see that there's an applique on the front of this one, and it actually has a date from 2016. I had made quilted journal covers for all of the participants that attended a fall retreat. Um, back when I worked for a quilt shop. So that is a version there. It didn't have a lot of quilting on it, but it had a little bit of applique. Um, I used a computer to print off the little design and did some fussy cutting. So if those are ter terms like applique that might scare you, that might be a place to practice a little bit. Or if you've never used a computer to even print onto fabric on those special prepared for printing sheets um, and fussy cutting. Those are ways to use it there. I'd even done some beading, which is something I wasn't really, uh, it was new to me. So I was practicing that as an embellishment. So that was one version of it, but I kind of simplified it and went a little bit more to the quilting side of it. So um, this was the first one that I made that you see in your pattern. And it was simply uh, a fabric that is near and dear to my heart because I'm, I'm an Iowa State Cyclone fan, even though we had a rough Saturday this last week. Um, <laughs> football season can be kind of tough on uh, alumni sometimes. Uh, this one was just a simple um, quilted, uh, channel quilted, so or not channel quilted, but a crosshatch quilting so that I was just crossing, cro doing crosshatch across the fabric and let the fabric do the speaking so that um, it's, it doesn't disrupt, disrupt the design and the pattern, which I absolutely loved. And in this one, I actually added a little bookmark kind of idea. Now, another version, because, you know, when you make one, that's never enough. Or two, you get going. It's kind of like eating potato chips. You just can't quit. Then I thought about, well, instead of using a solid piece of fabric, what, what if I go find some of those blocks that I've made that didn't make the cut, that, that didn't end up in the quilt? or the test blocks that I made back when I was working for a quilt shop or in a quilt magazine. So I went down and I got a test block. So there's the block. And yes, it's been trimmed down to fit on the outside of a journal cover, but how fun to use up those blocks 
and not have them just being wasted away somewhere. So if you have test blocks that are hanging out somewhere in a cupboard or drawer or on a design wall, maybe they will become a journal cover here. So what we need to collect up in our pattern in order to do this, all of your supplies are listed. It has the approximate amounts of fabric if you are doing a solid piece of fabric and then uh, a contrasting fabric for the pockets on the inside and then a, a backing fabric for when you're quilting your project. So that's the yardage there. If you're using a test block, you're gonna have to do a little bit of math and we're gonna be doing some simple math um, in the pattern itself. So that's what you'll need um, in order to create a journal cover. They're going to need supplies then, of course, always your rotor cutter and cutting mat, an acrylic ruler of uh, six by 24 or something similar. It's nice to have one that'll go across with the fabric or at least this is always my favorite go-to. It's an eight by um, 14. It's easy to maneuver on the, on the quilt table. Uh, let's see. We also, of course, need our scissors or snips for trimming and threads. Uh, Spray-based. Um, I tend to use the KK2000. So if you've, if you've watched me in the past, you know this is my favorite product. But whatever your favorite basting spray is, or maybe it's pin basting or hand basting with long stitches, whichever method works for you. And so if you haven't, um, haven't got into spray base and don't want to go that direction, you can always pin base. This is very small. It doesn't take very much time to, to base the layers when we're going to quilting. Um, if you're going to be quilting it, you're going to need a walking foot for your machine or a dual feed foot. Um, a dual feed foot looks a lot larger than this and it plugs into your machine, but some kind of way to do that layers so that things don't shift around when you're quilting the layers together. Um, then you're going to need uh, a fabric marking tool if you're trying to get a specific design or centered something. Uh, heat and bond tape, that's something we haven't used recently in any projects. Um, there are, there's heat and bond, there's steam a seam, there are a lot of different kinds of products similar to it on the market. This happens to be a quarter inch wide product cut in strips. It's tacky on one side. And as you apply this to fabric, then you can pull away the paper side and you have another strip of tackiness so that we can easily base something down. Um, you could use a glue stick also. That's another option for the little finishing spot that we're gonna do on our journal. And it happens to um, fall between the pocket areas in the um, out in the outer edge here. We want this to stay turned under and it could be pinned temporarily and stitched, but I didn't want stitching lines to show. So I did, um, if you wanna do a steam a seam or a heat and bond tape, it can be bonded in place. This isn't gonna be something that's gonna be washed. So it will hold it in place. You could hand stitch it down too. So that's an option there. Um, a satin ribbon, if you wanna put a bookmark into it. On mine, I just, um, cut a couple of lengths of, of satin ribbon so I could add a bookmark to it, depending on how it's going to be used as an option. And then, of course, your thread, pins, and an ironing board and surface to, to press on. So now as we get started, I guess the one thing I didn't actually put in the um, supply list was your journal. <laughs> Some kind of a journal that you want to make a cover for. That that, that's a little bit of an oops. I guess I should have put the journal in there. So you're a journal of some sort. Now there are different kinds out there. I've bought these at big box stores. This happens to have a wire um, type of binding mechanism. This is actually a sketchbook. Um, be perfect for drawing out ideas of qu quilts and quilt blocks. Um, this one was, uh, let's see, it's also a, it's got a metal binder in this one. I'm trying to think if I had any that didn't have, I guess they all had some kind of a wire binding in them. There are ones that have, they're just a folded stitched kind of um, binding, but I think the ones with the metal binding actually hold up a little longer. Your pages don't get loose and fall out. So, so pur purchase one that you like the size of. This pattern is written so you can make yours fit to the actual journal itself. The difference in uh, thickness of covers is gonna vary a little bit, but we'll talk about where you can kind of fix that as you and make them fit perfectly. Um, let's see, we've got people, let's see, Carlene's from Texas joining us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, Zena says, good morning from sunny North Central Florida. 
Oh, I'm glad the sun is shining in Florida right now. You, you, most of uh, central Florida has had a lot of rain. The northern part, maybe not so much, but I'm glad that you are all safe down there. Um, we've got um, someone says hello from White Lake, Michigan. Grandma Bird. Well, welcome, Grandma Bird. We're glad you're here from White Lake, Michigan. Um, it's a great Tuesday, and yeah, it's fun. It's it's the time to fall. We start to think about holidays. We're starting to think about gift ideas, and this might be the gift idea that you can put in the Christmas stockings. You can give to those people in your small quilt group. Um, maybe you're going to be traveling, traveling like I'm going to be soon. And I kind of like the idea of having a sketchbook so that as I see ideas, I could draw out because I always think I'm going to remember it, but I don't. So it's good to have something to record that in. Okay, let's get actually into the construction part here and trying to figure out how big do we cut our fabrics? What do we need in order to create this? So I kind of created a fill in the blank kind of pattern so that it can be customized to the quilt, um, to the, the journal that you actually end up purchasing. Because I can't guarantee that you're going to pick the same size as I did. Now, you'll see. These are similar, but this was a little taller. So it would have to be adjusted, right? So this is where we're going to get into the measuring. Um, it, it has you go ahead and just take a tape measure. This one's going to make a clicking sound on this. I'm going to expand a bunch of it. Okay, the first thing it says to do is to me measure the width of the book. So what we need to do is measure all the way around the binding. So putting a one inch or the zero on one end and go around that binding, make sure it stays on the outside of the metal and find out, okay, this measures 13 or so inches and maybe 13 and a quarter, just to make sure we get around that binding and not be too tight because we want the book to be able to close when we're done. So yeah, 13 and a quarter is, is a nice comfortable width around. So we have the, the whole distance around and then record that in your, um, in your kind of fill in the blank. It's kind of like those ones where you used to have stories and it says, put this number or this kind of word here. So you fill it in and you may want to make a, a second copy so you can, um, actually write in it, but keep one for use later in reference. So we've got 13 and a quarter around there, and that's going to be the letter A. So I put a, a, a alphabet letter with each of them because we're going to have to use those numbers again later and, and make this a little bigger. So we have our seam allowances a lot in there. Then we need the height of the journal. So it is eight and three quarters on this one. So I put eight and three quarters in point number two. That becomes now reference B. So in point three there, it'll tell you now your, your, your journal measures X number width by, by height. And we're going to go ahead and use those numbers and letters then later in number four. We're going to add two inches in both directions. And some people will say, well, two inches, that's, that's a lot of distance. Why are you adding so much? Well, depending on how you machine quilt this, it may tighten up and shrink a little bit. And as I always tell people, um, it's kind of like getting a haircut. You can always take some off, but you can't put it back on. So we're cutting it a little big in order to give us room to, if we do a lot of machine quilting, if it shrinks up a little bit, we still have enough to cover our journal. Okay, so I've got some pieces already cut here. And I will tell you a little tale. This uh, Yesterday when I started to get ready for this, I prepared my pieces weeks ago after I got done doing the original because I was so excited about doing this project and I promptly put them away from myself and I could not find them. So I have a second sample ready to go too because this morning I had to start again and uh, I have a whole nother uh, journal cover ready to go. So we have it in bits and pieces here. Okay, so we have the top fabric and batting. Now, this is where those scraps of batting that you trim away from table runners and small quilts, I never throw any batting away because I'm always finding those small pieces that I can use for another project. This one happens to be um, a, a polyester batting, but you could use any batting scrap whatsoever. It could be the 70-30 poly cotton combination. It might be a piece of leftover wool that's small that you don't know what you're going to end up using it for. But whatever batting you, you select, 
um, and then a backing fabric. Because when we're making a quilt sandwich, we always need those three layers. We have to have like two pieces of bread and the peanut butter in the middle, right? So we've got the the pretty fabric for the outer portion of our journal. We've got a batting and a backing and sandwich that together, whether it's a spray based or a pin based. If you're doing pin basting, remember that using your um, hand or a fist as a guide, make sure you place pins in about a quadrant at four corners around your hand so that you have enough pins to keep things from shifting as you quilt. If you get them too far apart, you get that shift in fabric and that's that's when you get folds and you get things not where you want them and doesn't look as pretty when you get done. So remember if you're pin basting, keep things um, at least probably four or five inches, you have a pin every every spot there. That's kind of why I tend to go to pin basting because pins always end up where I want to quilt. And then I'm taking them out faster than I'm actually quilting and trying to move them around. So get your quilt sandwich ready to go. And then it's time to decide um, what, how you want to quilt it. So on this, um, on my original one, I wanted to do just a simple grid. So I went in and used a, um, I think I used a friction pen when I was doing this, a chalk liner, whatever kind of marking tool where you can actually see the lines. And if you don't want to mark on this side, you can always mark on the backing fabric so that if it's something like a friction pen that is heat erasable, if ghost lines were to come back, it would be on the inside of your journal. You can get away with using it here. So you could put your grid here, do the stitching from the back side. If it's a grid, it doesn't really matter how it appears in the front because it's just an overall grid. And then you can heat erase to take them away when you're done. But since it's going to be on the inside, it won't matter as much. Now, that's one way to do your machine quilting. The other is, and the, another idea, is to use up those um, leftover blocks that you have that you haven't decided, oh, I didn't like the color combination. I wasn't sure how it was going together. Well, this guy, I'm not sure if anybody remembers a Valentine placemat that had Valentine hearts going across it. But as I got done with this one, I wasn't sure I really liked it. And so as I put this frame back on, you'll see that I literally like cut the center out of this placemat and decided it makes a really great journal cover instead because it was kicking around. And as this morning I ran across it, I'm like, oh, this would make a great journal cover. Don't want it as a placemat. Take that away. Make it fit. And so when I wrap this around my journal, these little hearts will run across that journal and just be adorable on a journal where I'm putting the things that really speak to my heart of quilt patterns or designs or techniques. So how perfect that it, it just hung around long enough for where, where it needed to be, I guess. Um, when it came to quilting this one, I was like, where do I start? And then I thought, you know, I wanted to look kind of like stripes on, um, on newspaper or on print paper. I'm going to show you the back because that will let you see that I just did some really easy straight line quilting. I didn't mark it. I literally used the marks on my foot, the different areas along my foot. Like one line was on the outside edge. One was on a real narrow that I could just eye it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be super exact. It's going to be a journal cover. It'll be okay. But this is a really great place to start thinking about, you know, if I haven't used my walking foot before or my e uh, dual feed foot or an integrated fe uh, feed on my machine, this might be the time to practice using it. And we have some examples. We had a, um, a, a live event that covered machine quilting tips and tricks. So our moderator is going to drop that link in. Maybe later you're going to be like, mm, I want to go back and think about some, you know, ways to machine quilt and get some ideas. And maybe you missed that, that show. So they'll put the link in there for you. So you can then um, go back and watch that at a later date. Remember, all of our videos always last forever in the videos tab. So you can always go out onto YouTube through our page, or you can go to um, our website, Facebook page, and find the, the drop down that has the videos in there. And you can go back and rewatch any episode you would like. So, okay. If we, if I cover something too fast or if I talk too fast, please let the moderators know. They'll pop up and let me know. Oh, go back and, you know, go review that real quick so that um, everybody um, gets, gets on the same page. Uh, Alice asks, 
how um, how to keep the spray adhesive from going all over? Mm, that's a really good question. Some spray based get a little bit more aerosolized than others. Um, what I have done in the past is um, found a piece of, or actually a box. Uh, what I used to, a lot of times would do is take a box and cut away like two sides of the box. So I made kind of a spray mm, little area. I lay my project in there if it's something small to keep it from um, the, the overspray from landing everywhere. Some, um, this one, the KK2000 seems to stay a little bit more localized and doesn't tend to overspray everywhere. So I feel comfortable using this in my um, sewing room or my studio. Um, other brands are a little bit messier, I, I will admit. Um, one thing that I have seen people do is that they put their projects up to spray. But when, if I were to put this on a design wall and spray the, the batting or whatever to get the basting spray on, I guess I think about gravity. Basting spray, if, I, if it comes out of the container, the extra falls and it ends up on the floor or whatever surfaces under it. So when I spray baste, I tend to leave it on a cutting space or a cutting area. You can cover the cutting area if you are afraid of overspray landing anywhere. This was a simple, um, inexpensive vinyl tablecloth. You can get those on clearance for probably a buck at a big back, big box store and just use it for that only as kind of a protection of your table, counter, cutting area. And I tend to hold up my, my piece and spray so that any overspray then falls onto the project and I have a little bit more control of the space that I'm spraying. And that seems to keep it from going everywhere. Um, there are some brands that just they when it comes out it it just goes everywhere and you can see it almost in the air um i've always had good luck with this one but i, I am not uh, a paid promoter of this product but um after using four or five i just settled on this one it just happens to be one that i i feel works it doesn't um stay in the air extremely long it seems to land where i want it and it can be easily directed so i hope that helps you out um let's see a great idea, uh, got a, a comment that's great idea to use an extra quilted piece for this. Um, I love many simple or sample blocks in my stash. I have many. Yes, we, we there's always that time we're testing out the color placement. Um, that was probably my biggest issue here. I wasn't sure about how I was um, backing the hearts on here or the fabric I was using for the hearts, but for this project, it works great. So when we're testing out that value placement, sometimes that's where it still would be a good block to put on a journal cover though. So think about using it there. Um, we've got people watching from everywhere from the UK to, oh man, it went away. I mean, Oregon, we've got people everywhere. This is great. I'm glad you guys are all joining us to, for this event. Okay. Back to our journal cover. Um, we've got the layers all quilted up and ready to go. Just like I said, you can just do some really simple quilting. This could be the place that maybe you want to practice that free motion quilting. So instead of putting the walking foot on uh, or the even feed foot, you need to have on a free motion foot. And that looks more like this little guy. Let me see if I can hold it up against something you can actually see. He's a little hopping foot. It has kind of a cup uh, U-shaped here. Sometimes they have a round hole for your thread to go through, but it easily um, maneuvers over your project. Just, I call it a hopping foot because it hops across. Um, as you do your free motion and you put your feed dogs down because you're then driving the fabric through. And this would be a great small project to practice that free motion quilting on. So having fun doing that. So you've got your sandwich all done. You've got it quilted. Um, back to some one of the cutting things that I did, didn't, I'm remiss on doing. We need to have those pocket areas, the areas that go on the inside to hold the journal cover onto um, the paper journal. And those, you would take your letter E. So you're taking the, um, the journal cover, I got to get the right spot here. B is the height of your journal cover plus one inch. So the journal 
this way plus one inch because you need a little bit for seam allowances again to get it inside of there. So I've just added an inch there to make those pieces and it needs to be 10 inches wide. 10 inches was just a random number, okay? That was enough of a pocket to, for it to stay on the, the journal and not fall off and, uh, and not so big that it would end up interfering in the binding portion here. So what we do is we're gonna be putting these four here on the inside portion. And the contrast here isn't the best or the match of fabric isn't the best, but it's on the inside. So we're gonna take those, um, we're gonna cut those that one inch um, high, taller than the, the actual journal by 10. And then we're pressing that to fold them in half. So they're five wide, wrong sides together because we want the pretty fabric to show. So by putting the wrong sides together and pressing that, it will now be five inches wide by the height of our journal plus that one inch. So press both of those, you have two of those. Okay back to construction of our journal let's see we have the name of the quilt pattern behind you ah uh, the one behind me is one that was done as a virtual retreat with national quilter circles so and craftsy so um, you can go to i believe i think it's available at a membership level for the um, class to learn the blocks there um, i was teamed up with another quilter and we team taught the different blocks and so um, this was my version of, um, of the retreat. So I'm glad you enjoy that. There's a lot of blocks in there. We may have to revisit some of those blocks and, and talk about how they're constructed because there's a lot of, um, there's some more difficult skills. Those aren't the easy things that we do here for live. We've got a lot of diamonds. We had set in seams, um, joining together of eight pieces here and how to do a, um, windows attic block with a diagonal there. There's a lot of really, there was a lot of really good techniques in that virtual retreat. So you may want to go back and search for that virtual retreat um, to to learn those techniques or make make note in a journal. I want to learn um, how to do a set in seam. I want to learn how to do an attic windows block so I can learn how to do that that seam that joins and makes a really pretty miter there. There's all kinds of fun things that if you haven't ventured into some of those skills yet, we have a lot of things that we teach through um, our, our website. So, okay, back to our journal. Let's see. Um, I got that folded. We are over in the construction now. We've got this ready to go. I went ahead and told you to either zigzag or um, surge that outer edge because it kind of gives a finished edge along the areas that are going to be near the binding. And if you don't quilt all the way to the outer edge, it also holds the layers in place. I will admit, as I was quilting this this morning, my backing fabric flipped over. It happens to all of us. I got a fold in it. I had to go back and take a piece out and fix that because you want all your layers laying nice and neat. And um, that will also help in this last construction if you fin finish that outer edge of your um, quilted section. Now, taking the um the pocket portions we are going to lay those on the right side of our journal cover and i have the folds toward the center so the folds are here facing each other make sure that you, when you place those the folds are going um towards each other in the center of the journal cover and we're going to be spacing those um a halfway in between you're going to have extra some will have more extra than others depending on your quilting amount um, it could be trimmed but at this point uh, a graded seam inside there when we turn this or you can you can trim it later but um, leaving a little bit uh, i've got probably a quarter to three eighths at the top and bottom along here on both sides and i'm aligning the cut edges of the pocket areas with the outer edge of my journal cover. This kind of allows a little bit of an, an adjustment depending on how thick the cover of your journal is. So I'm gonna pin those in place. Okay. Let's see if there's any other questions we have out there before we move on to putting this together. And my bifocals are getting pushed to their limit. Barb says, um, you can wait 
or you can write on your paper pattern with an erasable pen. That's true. You can do that. The erasable pen, like the friction pens or markers, you can write on it and then you can take it to the iron and erase the, the writing. That is another way to use your friction pen in your um, studio. Very good. I tend to forget that. I, I'm using those as marking tools for fabric and things, and then I forget that it can use as a double duty to erase off my pattern there. Or you can write real lightly with pencil. That's a choice too. Okay, we're going to take this over to the machine so we can stitch around and create our pockets. And in the instructions, I say to use a 3 8 inch seam allowance. And that's one you're probably not super comfortable with. So you're going to have to take your tape measure. Double check where a 3 8 is um, along the edge of your foot or where your needle and needle placement needs to be. But um, making sure that um, that you use about a 3 8 inch seam allowance here just to secure everything um, nicely. When you're starting out, you can start at any point, but I started near the pocket uh, fold. And I'm going to do a little reinforcement stitch there just so that any tug or pull, it's um, reinforce there and then stitch your way around when you approach the the outer edge over here where all the layers are matched up remember 3 8 inch seam allowance so that you can um, pivot oh, I want just a little bit too much one more stitch so that you get that 3 8 inch seam allowance whenever you go to pivot if you are kind of new to sewing Always have your needle in the down position. That makes a square corner for you, and it won't get rounded as the machine steps around the corner. Down this side. Just a few pins help hold those layers together because you've got, you know, you've got a quilt sandwich, and you've got a folded piece of fabric there as your pocket. So just a few pins to hold it in place, and we'll just go along. Now, you don't really have to break thread. You can just jump to stitch all the way to the other side. So I'm going to stitch along, kind of keeping an eye out for seam width according to the, the base plate of my sewing machine so that I know that I'm making a straight line. You could even go in with your fabric marking pen and mark your stitching line if you don't feel comfortable with where a 3 8 inch seam allowance is. We have lots of tricks to make us look like we know what we're doing <laughs> as quilters. Okay. <coughs> um, let's see. If there's any other questions? No, nope, we're good here. Whoops, one more stitch to get this. We want it to fit snug, but not so tight that our journal won't close properly when we're done. So stitch along here. One more side. And then I want to show you the real quick how to use that steam -a seam or heat and bond tape to finish off that raw edge. So let's get around to this edge. And then reinforce stitch as we get to that last folded edge. And maybe even just run a little bit further and reinforce stitch again. Cut threads. Okay, since I didn't take time to do a zigzag on my outer edge or serge it because I was in a kind of a hurry this morning, those are all would all be finished off. So you don't need to really trim anything there. What we're going to do, and you can see on the back side, the black stitching is what I just put in as I was putting the pockets in place. We're going to diagonally clip that corner because I need to reduce all that bulk before I turn the corners. So the diagonal line I drew through there, that's where I'm going to clip at. I'm going to go close to the tip of the corner where I pivoted, but not, I don't want to nick it. So I'm just going to make a diagonal cut, reducing that bulk. If you come to quilting from a garment sewing background, this will be reminiscent of doing points on collars and cuffs um, from garment sewing. We do that on all four corners to reduce that bulk. And then, well, I don't have my iron hot, we'll let him warm up. And what we're going to be doing is turning this top edge right where that seam allowance is there, and we're gonna turn it on this end so that we can fuse that down in place. It can be, like I said, it can be hand-stitched. Um, 
I didn't want to turn and top stitch this because then the stitching would show on the outside of my journal cover. And I just wanted to have a nice smooth finish there. So by using um, a heat and bond, you, if you have it by the yard because you do a lot of applique, that would be um, an acceptable um, cut a strip that would fit. This just happened to be the pre-cut type I had in my sewing room. So I figured I'll just use it. So we're going to take this, move some things out of our way here so we can bring in our ironing surface. No matter how much space we have in our sewing studios, we always need more space, don't we? Okay, bring this in. The heat and bond, this or the steam and seam tape here has kind of a papery side to it. And I can go in and I can iron on the papery side. It won't stick to my iron. Do that on both ends. And then once I have that in place and go according to the instructions on how long to heat it and um, the temperature setting on your, for your iron, you don't want to overheat it because you can actually melt that, that glue surface all the way into the fabric and then it won't adhere anymore. It'll just, it's what they call killing the glue. It's, it's totally absorbed into the fabric. Now I'm taking away the papery strip, which leaves that tackiness behind. And then I just turn the edge and heat in place. I'm going through some thicknesses here, but there we go. If it had been zigzag, it would have been just a little bit cleaner as it lays down there, but it's turned enough that will stay in place and make a really pretty finish along the binding portion of our journal. I'm going to do a quick turn, put my finger in and flip, flip there. I mean, you could trim your seam allowances down if you want, but it's going to all be on the inside. So it really probably won't matter too much how, how wide or narrow your seam allowances are because they're different, a um, little bit different width there, but the pocket being one width and the quilted portion being a little bit different. At least they're graded that way, they're different widths. So it kind of spreads out the layers. And you might need to use a tool or a pencil or something to poke out the corners to get them really nice there. Trim any stray threads. I just need to get my finger in there better. This is where a fingernail does come in handy on the thumb. There we go. Let's punch out this last two. One, two. There we go. Now you want to take it and you want to press the outer edge. So kind of folding to make sure that you have the pocket towards one side, the quilted per pretty portion right on that rim so you get kind of a nice crisp edge there and we're just about done like i said once you make one you're going to be like oh but what would this fabric look like or what about this spare block and um i have a feeling maybe we might see some pictures posted in the next few weeks of people uh, saying, oh, I did make some of those. Okay, here's the test. Making sure, oh, it slides in there just right. The idea, I love having the pockets be a little bit wider. It's reminiscent for me of having to make those brown paper covers that went on school books so that your math book wouldn't get all beat up when it went back and forth to school in your backpack. And I always liked having that pocket be big enough so it stayed on nicely. And I could always tuck little things inside there as kind of an extra folder for um, work or uh, homework stuff. So there is your journal cover. And if you need to adjust any, this might, might need just a little bit of adjustment here. I might go in and make that seem just a tiny bit wider here so that the, it fits a little snugger, but done and ready to go for 
whoever, or where, maybe that trip, maybe that um, quilt friend that needs just a little something for their birthday and you don't know what it's going to be. This is an easy project for you to create in a very short amount of time. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Can you repeat the comments about the placement of the pockets again? Okay, perfect. We've got, I'll slide it off. When we are putting the pocket places in position, line up the folded edges. I'm just going to unfold it. And then I can talk, talk to you about the adjustment if you need to adjust a bit in making it fit really nice and snug perfectly. Okay, here we go. The pocket portions, the folded edges are here. They're facing each other at the center of the journal. Because they're folded, we don't have to worry about seaming or anything. It makes them nice and sturdy. But the raw edges of that fold, the raw edges align out here. So I did have some, let's see, in another fabric colorway. Where did it end up at? Oh, I rolled it up inside here. So those pieces that we made our pockets up, up with were folded so we didn't have to hem them. And then that fold goes again to the center. The cut edge out here goes all the way to the outside edge of your quilted or the exterior portion of your bag or your journal. So we're aligning all the cut edges out here. I know it seems like, oh, but there's going to be a little extra. That's where that adjustment then can come in. If you need to make it um, a little bit snugger, you can take in that seam allowance right there to make it fit nice. You're going to have a little extra fabric, the extra width on the ends. It's going to be about, let's see, oh, maybe three eighths or so extra out here. But that gives you enough later to do that turn in and clean up that um, binding area. So it, the pocket's going to be centered along here, but it's going to line up on the short ends. So all those cut edges are aligned on the short ends of your journal. So that should should cover that. Okay. Yep, a very quick and easy project. Something fun to do, and you can personalize them. Um, you can, you know, if somebody likes a certain colorway, you can make them that. And I know I am very um, apt to pick up novelty fabrics like the Iowa State Cyclones, because that happens to be my team. But you know, those, those kinds of things, you see that fabric and you know, it speaks to someone you, you, in your group, if it's, um, they love hedgehogs or they, um, they absolutely love rainbow stripes, or, um, maybe even it's for, for kids for, um, I made sure that when we traveled on vacations, that all of my kids had a journal. Though my youngest at the time is like, Mom, I, I never wrote in that, but I found it recently and he did. He drew pictures of where we were at, the Grand Canyon and hiking and things like that. So you could personalize these for grandkids even so that each of them has a journal. Maybe they come and visit you at Christmas or they they love to go on trips places. It's something for them to draw and write when they're on a plane ride or in a car. Um that way they can write down things they saw. Mom and dad can help out with dating the pages, but it's a really fun to go back and look at later. So um, I think that uh, journaling and drawing and things have kind of made a resurgence. And this is one way that you can make those journals very personal. So thanks for joining me today for the quilted journal cover. We'll be back with some other small projects in a, just in a few weeks. See you.